Hey, good morning, church family here in Bethel and those abroad. Whether you're at your house watching this on Zoom, uh, whether you're here in the sanctuary or out in the parking lot listening to us on the radio, uh, I pray that you're doing well this morning. I am getting this done, this recording here, done a little late. Um, it's actually Saturday night. I don't know if you can see it in the clock right there, but it's uh, about a quarter after 11. Um, so uh, just now I was looking out sky, out, outside at the evening sky um, and just admiring how, how beautiful it, it is. And the thought occurred to me, I just uh, spent all day um, painting a dumpster over at the dump. Um, so I have a little paint on me still from painting out there. Um, but I, I was looking at the, at the evening sky. It's so beautiful the way God paints a different sky every night. And tonight's sky was just um, especially eye-catching for me. Um, the heavens declare the glory of God, truly. Um, so this morning, um, we'll just pray really quick. Um, so Lord God, I pray and ask um, you of the Lord God who has painted the evening sky tonight um, that you would be with us this morning as we seek to worship you as we seek to know you more as we um, enter into your presence and draw near to you according to the way that you've made through Jesus Christ uh, I pray that you would um, um, show us your glory Lord God I pray that you'd show us your glory so that we could um, spread your glory um, in our everyday lives, um, whether it's Sunday morning or Saturday night, um, just throughout our week. I pray that you would continue to refresh us with your glory um, so that we can share and spread um, that glory with others, Lord. Um, we read in your word that we're uh, blessed to be a blessing as the children of Abraham by faith. So I pray that you would um, Bless us not for our own sakes, but that you would bless us so that we could be a blessing to others around us. Um, Lord, so as you um, bless us, we bless you. Um, we bless your name and we glorify you this morning. We exalt in you and we lift your name high. Lord, um, painter of the skies, um, redeemer of the lost. Thank you, Jesus.
salvation where your love poured out over me now my soul cries out hallelujah praise and honor unto thee Sent of heaven God Son to purchase and redeem and reconcile the very ones who nailed him to that tree. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Praise and honor unto Thee. Now my debt is paid, it is paid in full. By the precious blood that my Jesus spilled. Now the curse of sin has no hold on me. Whom the sun sets free. Hallelujah, God be praised, He's risen from the grave. Oh, that rugged cross, my salvation, where your love poured out over me. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise Him honor unto thee. Now my soul cries out, hallelujah, praise and honor unto thee. Yes, Lord God, um, you received the wrath um, that we deserved on, on yourself, Lord. This is the grace um, that has been revealed to us by your word um, and testified to within us by your spirit. Um, so I pray, Lord God, that um, as we hear about um, your wrath, um, that you would teach us more about what what that means, what you took on yourself for us, that we would receive a greater understanding of the wrath deserved for us that you poured out on, on Jesus. Um, and in so doing, that we would have a greater understanding of your grace and a greater understanding of who you are, Lord. Um, so I pray for Adam as he um, shares the word um, and, and for us um, this morning. So... Amen. Um, I believe now we'll have a, a short time of uh, prayer, more prayer and announcements. And after that, we'll have Adam uh, bring the word. Good morning, church. It's so good to be back with you again. Um, as you can see, we're doing things a little bit differently here today. And um, I just want to thank Fred, first of all, for covering the pulpit last week um so unfortunately i was out of town last week i came back on sunday a week ago um but i took my COVID test at the airport and i have not received the results back yet so technically i'm supposed to still be in quarantine so that's why we are doing all zoom today so i pre-recorded the sermon so that way i could be in the church but i can't be in the church during the um actual worship service and that's okay because we can still continue to worship together 
In fact, I just saw on Facebook um, earlier last night that the Moravian Church has decided that they're going to stop doing in-person services altogether um, for the foreseeable future. And that's okay. It's okay to not meet together face to face in the midst of uh, circumstances like COVID. Um, at the same time, we lament, we miss that face-to-face -face interaction. So I encourage you, um, as you feel safe, as you have your social bubbles, to meet together and to encourage one another just as the Bible teaches us. And to make church not just Sunday morning, but to make church your entire life. That we don't go to church, we are the church. And so today we are the church, even though we're meeting via Zoom, and there's going to be some people that are meeting here in the sanctuary, some people that are going to be meeting in their uh, own homes, maybe on their phones, computers, streaming it onto their TV. And we're so glad that you're here with us today because God's Holy Spirit is so much bigger than coronavirus, is so much bigger than me or you. And though the enemy is trying to break down the walls of the church, Jesus says that he will build his church and the gates of hell shall not stand against it. So today we are going to be looking in the book of Job. So we took a little break last week. We went into Revelation. We're actually going to go into Revelation a little bit today as well. Um, but we're going to be focusing on Job chapters 18 and 19. Would you pray with me, please? Dear Father God, I thank you so much that you love us and that you give us ways to meet together through technology and throughout the week, Lord, that we can care for and love one another, that we can uh, focus on a relationship with you, that we can pray and read the Bible, and Lord, we can put that into action. Lord, help us to be the church during this time, and Lord, I just pray that you would open our hearts and minds to the story of Job and how it is uh, truth for us today. Uh, Lord, I pray that you would help us to figure out what is the truth and what things are just uh, Job and his friends getting things a little bit mixed up. And Lord, that you would just reveal to us, especially what it means uh, to, to um, know about your wrath and how you give us grace and forgiveness through Jesus Christ. In Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So if you have your Bibles, you can go ahead and open up to Job chapter 18 and 19. That's where we're going to be at today. And as you're going ahead and flipping there, whether you have your physical paper Bible or you have it on your phone, your device, I encourage you open that up, follow along with me. And as you're getting there, um, I was thinking about God's wrath and thinking about Job 18 and 19 this week. And I was thinking about when I was little, I remember a time where I went to the grocery store. And I know, going to the grocery store now is a different experience than it was, what, five, six months ago. But nevertheless, still, I remember going as a little kid and getting something off the aisle. I don't know what it was. Uh, but have you ever done that where you went and you went to grab something and you slipped or there was like too much loaded on the on the shelf there and something fell off and broke. What a feeling of dread that is for a child. Now, I remember that sense of dread that, oh no, I just broke something. I just spilled something. Somebody is going to be really mad at me, whether it's my parents or the people who work at the store. That was even more what I think I was afraid of, the people that worked at the store. And wouldn't you know it, one of the people who worked at the store came up and, um, and one of my parents probably, my, I think my mom probably apologized and said, I'm so sorry. And um, I was expecting punishment. I was expecting wrath, the wrath of the, of the store worker. Um, but little did I know that the store had a policy. Most, most stores have policies yeah, that, you know, if accidents happen, there is um, accidental loss coverage. They can bring that product and there's a certain amount of acceptable loss. And um, the payment for that broken item, rarely in most grocery stores at least, goes to the customer. 
Most of the time, the store will pay for that item for them. Um, so I did not have to pay, although I had nothing to pay with as a child, to pay for what was broken. Sometimes we as Christians think that we need to pay for the brokenness in our hearts, to pay for the brokenness of our sins. And we don't realize that God has created, not necessarily a policy, but God has created a way so that we don't have to feel his wrath. We can be saved from his wrath through Jesus Christ. And unfortunately, our friends Job and Bildad did not fully understand that yet because they didn't have Jesus yet. And so we have a distinct advantage. We have some 2020 vision where we can look back and see what they missed. Um, yet there is still some nuggets of truth in there. So Job 18 and 19, talking about Job's, uh, talking about God's wrath. So as you know, we've been going through the book of Job. Um, we're getting close to the halfway mark. And really this is a book where people point to, where they ask a question, why do bad things happen to good people? And it's not actually a question that we see answered here. Now we can wrestle through that, we can come up with some of our own answers, but we don't actually get from the text exactly why do bad things happen to good people. So Job, he lost everything. He lost his family, his wealth, his servants, his property, um, and he was broken. He was a broken man. And so his three friends came to be with Job, and they comforted him for seven days, and everything was relatively as it should be. The friends were good friends. And then they opened their mouths. And so they began to basically accuse Job of some sort of wrongdoing, of, that he was guilty, and that he was wicked, that he had done something to deserve the trouble and punishment that God had apparently given. And so um, each of the friends take turns speaking. And so we had one cycle where all three spoke, and now we are in the second cycle, and the second friend who is speaking. And that friend is Bildad. And I mentioned last time when Bildad spoke that uh, I often think of Bilbo Baggins from, uh, from The Hobbit or uh, The Lord of the Rings when I think of Bildad. And I said, please forgive me if I say Bilbo instead of Bildad. And I don't think I said it at all last time, but uh, the same thing still applies to this time and also the next time that I talk about Bildad. If I say Bilbo, please forgive me, it's actually Bildad. And we don't know where Bildad came from um, as far as like where that actually is on the map, but we do know that um, he was probably a wise, wealthy man like Job. And so he had some apparent wisdom. And yet he still didn't quite fully understand who God was. And so um, we should take the wisdom of, of uh, Job and his friends, especially Bildad here, and we should take some of it and say, well, where's the truth in it? And where uh, did he not quite get it right? We take it with a grain of salt, as it were. Um, but as we're getting ready to read, we're actually going to read through the whole two chapters today. We won't always do that, uh, but Job 18 and 19, we're going to be, or sorry, yeah, 18 and 19, we're going to read together. Uh, but to frame the whole thing, sometimes I like to open up a book and read the end and see, um, at least that's what my English teacher used to tell me in high school. Open it up, read the back, and see if it's something that you want to actually read. And um, so... If you were to do that in the Bible, you'd get to Revelation, you might be like, oh, maybe I should go back and read some of this other part. Uh, but in this one, Job 18 and 19, the final verse, I think, frames this whole dialogue between Bildad and Job today. So Job 19, 29 says, Be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings a punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. This is Job speaking in response to Bildad. Be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Wow, there's a lot of fear in there. There's a lot of, um, a lot of stuff in there. Let's, uh, let's try to unpack it a little bit. Um, fortunately, we talked a little bit about the fear of the Lord two weeks ago, the last time we talked about Job. And how the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And it talks about that in Proverbs and Psalms. It's all throughout the Bible. God says, do not fear. And yet, we are to be God-fearing. 
And so what does it mean to fear? To fear God is simply to realize our place of vulnerability because of our sin, and rather than hiding from it, to surrender to God. And that is the proper fear of the Lord that is the beginning of all wisdom. And so if we can apply that to also the wrath of God, then we're definitely going to get somewhere. So let's go to Job chapter 18, and let's go ahead and read. So this is going to take a little while. I really encourage you to follow along so you don't get lost. Job 18 and 19, we're going to read through the whole dialogue here. Then Bildad the Shuhite answered and said, How long will you hunt for words? Consider, and then we will speak. Why are we counted as cattle? Why are we stupid in your sight? You who tear yourself in your anger, shall the earth be forsaken for you, or the rock be removed out of its place? Indeed, the light of the wicked is put out, and the flame of his fire does not shine. The light is dark in his tent, and his lamp above him is put out. His strong steps are shortened, and his own schemes throw him down. For he is cast into a net by his own feet, and he walks on its mesh. Bildhead's got some strong words for Job. Why aren't you listening to us? Continuing on, verse 9. A trap seizes him by the heel, a snare lays hold of him. A rope is hidden for him in the ground, a trap for him in the path. Terrors frighten him on every side and chase him at his heels. His strength is famished, and calamity is ready for his stumbling. It consumes the parts of his skin. The firstborn of death consumes his limbs. He is torn from a tent in which he trusts and is brought to the king of terrors. In his tent dwells that which is none of his. Sulfur is scattered over his habitation. Bildad is uh, saying, if you are wicked, you are going to be utterly and completely destroyed. Verse 16, his roots dry up beneath and his branches wither above. His memory perishes from the earth, and he has no name in the street. He is thrust from light into darkness and driven out of the world. He has no posterity or progeny among his people, and no survivor where he used to live. They of the west are appalled at his day, and horror seizes them of the east. Surely such are the dwellings of the unrighteous. Such is the place of him who knows not God. So Bildad's making a very clear statement here. He's saying, Job, you're clearly unrighteous because all of this calamity has come upon you. Surely you are unrighteous. Even going so far as to say to Job, you don't even really know God. And uh, what what an insult there. And these are supposed to be Job's friends. And yet they come here uh, to Job and they don't understand themselves really who God is. And the truth is none of us can fully know who God is. He's so far beyond our imagination, so far beyond our understanding. And yet God loves us so much that he allows us to have glimpses of him, to understand his character. Though we might not fully understand how he works, um, we can see his letter to us in the Bible. We can see how he works through the church. We can see how he responds to our prayers. We can know God personally because of Jesus Christ. But poor Bildad and Job, they did not have that benefit. And so Bildad brings it down hard to Job in Job 18. And so Job 19, we pick it up, Job's response. Then Job answered and said, how long will you torment me and break me into pieces with words? These ten times you have cast reproach upon me. Are you not ashamed to wrong me? And even if it be true that I have erred, my error remains with myself. If indeed you magnify yourselves against me and make my disgrace an argument against me, know then that God has put me in the wrong and closed his net about me. Behold, I cry out violence, but I am not answered. I call for help, but there is no justice. He has walked up my way so that I cannot pass, and he has set darkness upon my paths. So this is a familiar cycle. Job's friends give some advice, and Job says, what, what are you even saying? That makes no sense. You are not being good friends. And then he then goes on to defend himself. Uh, so this is the cycle that we continue on. Verse 9, he has stripped from me my glory and taken the crown from my head. 
He breaks me down on every side and I am gone. And my hope has he pulled up like a tree. He has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. Let me read that one again, because this is really kind of the heart of, uh, of Job's defense this time. He, that being God, he, Job is claiming, he has kindled his wrath against me and counts me as his adversary. His troops come on together. They have cast up their siege ramp against me and encamp around my tent. He has put my brothers far from me and those who knew me are wholly estranged from me. My relatives have failed me. My close friends have forgotten me. The guests in my house and my maidservants count me as a stranger. I have become a foreigner in their eyes. I call to my servants, but he gives me no answer. I must plead with him with my mouth for mercy. My breath is strange to my wife, and I am a stench to the children of my own mother. Even young children despise me. When I rise, they talk against me. All my intimate friends abhor me, and those whom I love have turned against me. My bones stick to my skin and to my flesh, and I have escaped by the skin of my teeth. Have mercy on me. Have mercy on me, O you, my friends, for the hand of God has touched me. Why do you, like God, pursue me? Why are you not satisfied with my flesh? Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. Oh, that with an iron pen and lead they were engraved in the rock forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. And after my skin has been thus destroyed, yet in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. My heart faints within me. If you say, how will we pursue him? And the root of the matter is found in him. Be afraid of the sword, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know that there is judgment. And so Job kind of turns it around there at the end. And so if I'm facing wrath, so are you going to face wrath, Bildad and my friends. And to that, that is true. All of us deserve God's wrath. But Jesus Christ came to take that wrath. So oftentimes people will think that uh, we are sinners in the hands of an angry God, that his desire is simply to come and pound the earth for its sin, to come and punish us for our sin. And certainly there is some real truth in that. And because of our sin, we deserve that wrath. Lots of us uh, lots of the world has an Old Testament picture of what God's wrath is, which is true, but it is not a full picture. That's why we have the Old Testament and the New Testament, for the Old Covenant was just a shadow for the New. And so we see some things true, like uh, in Nahum 1, 2, and 3, the Lord is a jealous and avenging God. The Lord is avenging and wrathful. The Lord takes vengeance on his adversaries and keeps wrath for his enemies. And that's that's often, if you just take that verse and you contain it all by itself, people think that God just wants to squash the world. God just wants to squash us for our sin. But Nahum 1.3 reminds us, the Lord is slow to anger. The Lord is slow to anger and great in power. And the Lord will by no means clear the guilty. His way is in whirlwind and storm, and the clouds are the dust of his feet. So certainly the wrath of God is a real thing, and we need to recognize that. That's part of why we fear the Lord, because we recognize our vulnerability because of our sin, and yet we realize that God is slow to anger, that he is a God of grace, that he loves us so much he doesn't leave us to face his wrath if we follow Jesus. But if we don't follow Jesus, then we should fear the wrath of God. Now it's interesting that Job, I really like his, uh, his response in this one. There's a lot of funny things about that. Uh, but it's interesting that he has a little irony there, a little part in Job 19.23. Um, you see, the majority of this book of Job, it's an ironic situation where both Job and his friends claim to know the spiritual reality, but actually they really have no real understanding of the spiritual battle raging all around them. And just as Job 19.23 shows a little bit of that irony, um, he says, Oh, that my words were written. Oh, that they were inscribed in a book. And wouldn't you know it, here it is here in 
the book of Job that millions of people have heard and read, um, that his words were inscribed in a book. And who was it that wrote this? We don't really actually fully know. Um, some say that Job wrote this of himself. This is an account. Uh, but regardless, you know, God wanted to use Job and his life and this account um, to teach us something, that it would be inscribed in a book, that it would teach us that God's wrath is real, but God's grace is also real. See, Bildad, he argues that the wicked are punished, but what Bildad describes is a future spiritual judgment. All throughout the Old Testament, even through the New Testament, we see the day of judgment. We see God's wrath being fulfilled at the day of uh, at the end of times, at the end of Revelation, we see God's wrath fulfilled. And certainly there are times where we see God's wrath poured out as well. Uh, you can think of Sodom and Gomorrah, for instance, or some of the enemies of Israel, um, where their, their sin has come to such fruition that there is no choice, but they are given over to wrath. And yet there are still ways out, just as in Sodom and Gomorrah, they were given the opportunity to go. Uh, just as with Noah, they were given the opportunity to repent and go into the ark, and yet um, there was none righteous enough except for Noah and his family. So even that, there are times in the Old Testament where God's wrath is clearly poured out, but there's always a way out. Um, but most of the time when the Bible talks about God's wrath, it's a future final judgment. And that's something that's going to come to all of us at the end of our time, no matter how it is that we meet our maker, how we die, whether it's um, right after the sermon, whether it's in uh, 70 more years, God knows exactly when that is. And we are going to see God face to face and we are going to have our own judgment day. And so Bildad is describing this, this judgment as if it's something that's happening right now. But really, the Bible mostly talks about that. That's the end of days. That's the final judgment. Um, it's not actually the present earthly reality, especially because of Jesus. You know, especially you can look at the book of Revelation. And Revelation is the final judgment. God has given us chance after chance after chance after chance after chance to repent and turn to him. And it's really only at the very end when everybody has stopped repenting that we see all of these plagues happen and all of the bowls of wrath poured out, the trumpets blown. Um, encourage you to read Revelation on your own, uh, but don't just do it by yourself. Talk to other people who have read it. Um, just as in our men's Bible study, we're finishing up Revelation here real soon. Uh, but it all it's all connected. Uh, check it out, Isaiah 63, 3 through 4. I have trodden the winepress alone, and from the peoples no one was with me. I trod them in my anger and trampled them in my wrath. Their lifeblood spattered on my garments and stained all my apparel, for the day of vengeance was in my heart, and my year of redemption had come. And it's really interesting how wrath and redemption are often intertwined. And so God is going to bring a final day of judgment. There is going to be a wrath, but there's also redemption for those who follow Jesus. And so Bildad doesn't quite get it right. Job doesn't quite get it right. See, Job attributes all of his trouble to God's wrath. And it seems that he thinks that God's wrath is the whole reason that everything has happened. And it's kind of like... Um, Oftentimes when, when the world thinks of God's wrath, it's an illogical kind of wrath. It's like God is just waiting and ready to punish, to strike, and sometimes even just as things randomly. He just tosses out a hurricane there, just as there was a hurricane um, that, uh, that uh, is in the south that I, I just briefly saw on the news this morning. And we can think that, oh, that was God's wrath or the earthquakes or um, whatever it is. Coronavirus, that's God's wrath. And while there might be pieces of that, that God allows it so that people will turn back to him. Um, ultimately, that's nothing compared to the final judgment. And Job, likewise, he's saying that all of this trouble is because of God's wrath. But both Job and Bildad seem to have no acknowledgement of another enemy, namely Satan. 
And we know that this is Satan's doing because of the first couple of chapters of Job, how um, the enemy, Satan, was going back and forth from the earth, and he told God, you know, Job is only following you because of the good things that are happening. Let me give him trouble. Let me do these things to him, and God allows it. And so it's not necessarily that it's God doing it, but it's the enemy who's doing it. Job mistakenly seems to think that God is his accuser. And so we can actually see that all throughout the book of Job, that Job is trying to defend himself, almost in a courtroom kind of setting. And rather than trying to defend himself against the great accuser, as he should be, and claiming um, God as his savior, that Jesus Christ is the one who died for our sins, and of course Job didn't know that, but we know that, we should be claiming the blood of Jesus um, when we are in the courtroom of life. And Job instead, though, is seeing God as his accuser. Uh, unfortunately, he, because of that, he gets things wrong. And it's not until the end of the book where um, God kind of sets, the, sets Job straight. Uh, but there has been a great accuser since the very beginning. We can think of the serpent in the Garden of Eden. And we know that there is an evil one in this world. And um, that's part of why we, we pray the Lord's Prayer and deliver us from evil. And uh, some translations will even say deliver us from the evil one. And you see, it's not God who is necessarily always punishing us in our lives, but there is sin in this world. Sometimes it's our own sin that causes us trouble. Sometimes it's the sin of other people that cause us trouble. And sometimes it might be some spiritual attack. It might be the enemy, Satan, and his followers, his, his uh, fallen angels, the demons who are trying to give us trouble. And yet, God's grace, his redemption, is always tied in with wrath. We have a choice. But Job's friends have gotten things a little bit wrong. And Job has gotten things a little bit wrong. He thinks he's in this courtroom of life where God is his accuser and Job's friends have somehow become a substitute for God in the courtroom because Job is arguing with his friends as if they are also the ones who are accusing him, as if God is the one who is accusing him. And so Job just has this whole wrong understanding of uh, who is accusing him. And because of that, Job's friends have become a substitute for God in the courtroom and are doing nothing to further Job's understanding of God's wrath. And, and they likewise... Job's friends are doing nothing to further Job's understanding of God's grace and redemption. You see, it's the exact opposite of how God designed the church. God designed the church for us to go and search the scriptures together. The covenant church is built on the question, where is it written? And I love that about our church. Where is it written? Let us search the scriptures together. Let's find the answer together. Let's wrestle through God's word together and let's find God's grace and redemption. And Job's friends instead are just pointing to judgment. But we, as God's redeemed people, should be pointing to God's redemption. And God is such a God that while he has wrath, He's not like us. When we have wrath, when we have anger, we often fall into sin. But God's word, Ephesians 4, 26 says, In your anger, do not sin. Do not let the sun go down while you are still angry. And while that seems impossible for us, for God it is not only possible, that is his true character. While he has wrath because he hates sin, he hates the enemy, he wants the uh, he wants sin to be completely squelched, and someday he is going to come and fulfill the rest of his redemption that began through Jesus Christ on the cross. While we can be heavenly forgiven, we still have earthly consequences until the final day, the final day of God's wrath, when he makes all things new. He does not sin in his wrath. Um, just as we already said, Job twenty, or sorry, Job nineteen twenty five, is uh, is where we see God's wrath and redemption tied together. 
In fact, Job 19, 25, and 26 are the only clear example of God's grace in this whole exchange between Bildad and Job in chapters 18 through 19. So Job, in the midst of all of this great rant about God's wrath and how people have done him wrong, how God has done him wrong, to his credit, he has this little nugget of truth still in there. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. In the midst of all the trouble in our lives, can we say that? I know that my Redeemer lives, and at the last he will stand upon the earth. There is a great Redeemer, and his name is Jesus Christ. And like Job, Jesus took on suffering that he did not deserve. Like Job, Jesus took on suffering that he did not deserve. But unlike Job, who was started to say, no, you did it, you did it, it was God who did it. Unlike Job, Jesus willingly took God's wrath on our behalf. And Jesus calls us to pick up our cross and follow him. Jesus calls us to do the same thing, to be willing to take upon God's wrath. And not necessarily in the way where, uh, where we are going to be able to save people from God's wrath, but sometimes that means entering into the struggles of others, entering into the trouble of others, entering into the hurts and pains of others, and pointing to the great Redeemer. I know that my Redeemer lives. See, Jesus was the Passover lamb that took upon the sins of the world. When he went to the cross, he died for you and for me. John 3, 36 says, whoever believes in the Son has eternal life. Whoever does not obey the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God remains on him. And that brings us to this fancy theological word, the word atonement. An atonement is the redemption of humanity by the suffering and death of Christ. And um, there's lots of different ideas about the atonement, and certainly one of them is that the wrath of God is appeased on the cross through Jesus Christ. And we see that in one of my favorite songs, In Christ Alone, till on that cross as Jesus died, the wrath of God was satisfied. And um, there's a lot of people who have trouble with that. In fact, there are some covenant churches even that band singing that song because they don't see God's wrath as being fulfilled necessarily in Jesus Christ on the cross. Um, and they have some good, uh, good reasons um, why that might be because was God really angry, wrathful towards Jesus Christ? Um, I'm not totally sure, but I actually like the wording of that song, and I wish people would look at that more. The wrath of God was satisfied. Didn't mean necessarily that that was fully all poured out, that, that God was so uh, wrathful towards Jesus, but that because of Jesus' sacrifice, the wrath of God was satisfied. The wrath that we deserved was satisfied, and whatever that means. Um, another aspect of the atonement is the prodigal son that God is simply waiting with open arms for us to repent and turn to him, and he holds us tight, and that's only because of Jesus Christ. And so atonement, the idea that Jesus' sacrifice on the cross is um, the redemption of humanity by the suffering and death of Christ, that is the atonement. Um, that's different aspects of the atonement. And so um, I know we're running a little bit late, but um, there's lots of different theories of the atonement, how Christ took our punishment, how Christ saves us. Um, maybe this, uh, this slide can be put up on Facebook later. You can look through these different theories of atonement. And some people will say, well, you only need to have one theory of atonement. Uh, but I actually think that there's truth in all of these different aspects, just like a multifaceted gem. How there's when you look at it different ways, you can see different ways that um, Jesus Christ dying on the cross uh, fulfilled God's purpose. Whether it was taking our sin, God's wrath, uh, that He was showing victory over death, that He paid our ransom, that He is the new Adam. You can take a look at some of those. But ultimately, God's wrath is tied directly to our faith in following Jesus. If we follow Jesus, we are saved from God's wrath. If instead we rely on our own good deeds, 
we will one day face God's full wrath. So we have two choices, you see. There's two paths. If we follow Jesus, we are saved from God's wrath. But if instead we rely on our own good deeds, which is kind of what Job's friends are trying to say, you just need to be better. You just need to be more innocent. If we rely on our own good deeds, then we actually do need to fear God's wrath. Because one day we will face God's full wrath if we take option B. But God's plan for us is to follow Jesus. That's his plan A. And um, just as if we follow him, we'll have the fruits of the Spirit. If we don't follow him, then we are going to be stuck with the fruits of the flesh, the works of the flesh. And just as Isaiah 63, uh, we read earlier, the, the uh, God's wrath was poured out just like grapes of wrath. Um, we see that in Revelation 14 as well, uh, Revelation 19 as well. And um, our, our fruits, whether they're spiritual fruits that uplift or they're the fruits, the works of the flesh, God's going to use those um, just as if they were like grapes that are going to be crushed to, uh, to pour out his wrath. So we have a choice, and God's desire for us is if we know the Redeemer, that we are supposed to live it out in faith, to follow Jesus, just as the centurion did um, in Matthew 8, 8 through 13. And there's uh, several instances that, uh, that make it clear. You know, the centurion went and said, Jesus, please heal my servant. You don't even have to go there. You can just command it. And Jesus was amazed, and he said... Um, Truly I tell you, with no one in Israel have I found such faith. I tell you, many will come from east and west and recline at table with Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob in the kingdom of heaven, while the sons of the kingdom will be thrown into the outer darkness. In that place there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. You see, God makes it really clear. Jesus made it really clear. If you follow me and have faith, you will know the Redeemer. But if not, there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. There's going to be God's full wrath upon you. God's desire for us is like Job to not just say, I know that my Redeemer lives and that in the end he will stand upon the earth, but to live that out, to follow Jesus daily, to pick up our cross and follow him. How is God calling you to do that today? Let us pray. Dear Father God, I thank you for your love. I thank you for how you take care of us. Thank you for the Redeemer, Jesus Christ. Lord, I pray that we'd really take this to heart, that, uh, that the wrath of God is a, is a real thing, but that the blood of Jesus Christ is far more powerful. Lord, help us to find ways where we can live that out and that we can enter into the hurts and pains of a lost and hurting world and show them the gospel hope of Jesus Christ. Amen. Call on justice now for the closing song. All right, thank you, Adam. Man, one of the things I miss most about meeting in person is hearing Adam live right up there on the pulpit, hearing the message that God gave him to bring to us, and um, standing back up um, to help us um, worship God and, and, and share a little bit of what what God's Spirit spoke to me in the words of Adam, um, or whoever's up there as they preach, um, hoping that in some way it may be encouraging to the rest of the people in here. Um, but in this past week, one of my daily readings was Psalm 22. Um, so I'm gonna, just going to read through Psalm 22 right quick. It says, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? Why are you so far from saving me from the words of my groaning? Oh my God, I cry by day, but you do not answer, and by night I find no rest. Yet you are holy, enthroned on the praises of Israel. In you our fathers trusted. They trusted, and you delivered them. To you they cried and were rescued. In you they trusted and were not put to shame. But I am a worm and not a man, scorned by mankind and despised by the people. All who see me mock me. They make mouths at me. They wag their heads. He trusts in the Lord. Let him deliver him. Let him rescue him, for he delights in him. Yet you are he who took me from the womb. You made me trust you at my mother's breasts. On you was I cast from my birth, and from my mother's womb you have been my God. Be not far from me, for trouble is near, and there is none to help. Many bulls encompass me. Strong bulls of Bashan surround me. They open wide their mouths at me like a ravening and roaring lion. 
I am poured out like water, and all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted within my breast. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, and my tongue sticks to the jaws, to my jaws. You lay me in the dust of death. For dogs encompass me, a company of evil doers encircles me. They have pierced my hands and feet. I can count all my bones. They stare and gloat over me. They divide my garments among them, and for my clothing they cast lots. But you, O Lord, do not be far off. O you, my help, come quickly to my aid. Deliver my soul from the sword, my precious life from the power of the dog. Save me from the mouth of the lion. You have rescued me from the horns of the wild oxen. I will tell of your name to my brothers. In the midst of the congregation I will praise you. You who fear the Lord, praise him. All you offspring of Jacob, glorify him. And stand in awe of him, all you offspring of Israel. For he has not despised or abhorred the affliction of the afflicted. And he has not hidden his face from him, but has heard when he cried to him. From you comes my praise in the great congregation. My vows I will perform before those who fear him. The afflicted shall eat and be satisfied. Those who seek him shall praise the Lord. May your hearts live forever. All the ends of the earth shall remember and turn to the Lord, and all the families of the nations shall worship before you. For kingship belongs to the Lord, and he rules over all the nations. All the prosperous of the earth eat and worship. Before him shall bow all who go down to the dust, even the one who could not keep himself alive. Posterity shall serve him. It shall be told of the Lord to the coming generation that they shall come and proclaim his righteousness to a people yet unborn, that he has done it. It would be easy enough to see this psalm and think of Job in his suffering. Um, but clearly, um, we see Jesus in this psalm, even as he quoted this psalm from the cross um, before he finally gave up the ghost, as King James would say. But it was God who led Jesus um, to the cross. Um, so I'm going to sing Oceans, um, Where Feet May Fail. And oftentimes I sing this song and, and I would sing it as though I'm asking God to lead me. Um, and certainly I do. Um, but just um, it occurred to me as Jesus um, also trusted in God, even as he was born from his mother. Ask God to lead him, I'm sure.
trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior Spirit lead me where my trust is without borders Let me walk upon the waters Wherever you would call me Take me deeper than my feet could ever wander And my faith will be made stronger In the presence of my Savior And I will call upon your name Keep my eyes above the waves So will rest in your embrace I am yours, and you are mine. So, Lord God, you may lead us, um, you may lead us into troubling times. You may um, bring us um, into difficulty. Even you, Lord, promised that we would have trouble. Lord, but as we um, are led by you, help us to trust in you. Um, that even as you led your son to the cross, it was for our good and for your glory. On a hill far away stood an old rugged cross. The I love that old cross where the dearest and best for a world of lost sinners was slain. So I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down. I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown Oh, that old rugged cross So despised by the world As a wondrous attraction for me Cherish the old rugged cross Till my trophies at last I lay down And I will cling to the old rugged cross And exchange it someday for a crown In the old rugged cross stained with blood so divine a wondrous beauty I see for it was on that old cross Jesus suffered and died to pardon and sanctify me so I'll cherish the old rugged cross till my trophies at last I lay down and I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown to the old rugged cross I will lay shame and reproach gladly bear then he'll 
call me someday to my home far away where his glory forever I'll share so I'll cherish the old rugged cross my trophies at last I lay down I will clean And exchange it someday for a crown Sometimes Tia says I end up singing like a country singer Especially on sing songs like that I feel like sometimes I may turn into a country singer uh, So this last song is Grace Alone um, Just as Adam shared um, We understand the wrath of God by understanding the grace of God um, or it was the other way around. I don't remember. But anyway, um, recently uh, in men's Bible study, we went through the book of Revelation. Um, and one of the cool things I noticed about Revelation is that the beginning of the book and the end of the book um, both have start and end with grace. Um, just as Revelation is ultimately a heralding in of uh, the fruition of the grace given to us even today. Um, it's by grace alone. at the fall running away when I'd hear you call but father you worked your will I had no righteousness of my own I had no right to draw near your throne but father you love me still and in love before you laid the world's foundation Adopt me as your own You have raised me up so high above my station I'm a child of God by grace and grace alone You left your home to seek out the lost You knew the great and terrible cost But Jesus, your face was set I worked my fingers down to the bone But nothing I did could ever atone But Jesus, you paid my debt By your blood I have redemption and salvation Lord, you died that I might reap what you have sown And you rose that I might be a new creation in darkness all of my life I never knew the day from the night but spirit you moved in me I swore I knew the way on my own a head full of rocks a heart made of stone but spirit you moved in me and at your touch my sleeping spirit was awakened on my darkened heart the light of Christ has shown Called into a kingdom that cannot be shaken Heaven's citizen by grace and grace alone So I'll stand in faith by grace and grace alone I will run the race by grace and grace alone I will slay my sin by grace and grace alone I will reach the end by grace and grace alone So this week I tried buttermilk for the first time. I've tried it because Eli Jacobson apparently really likes buttermilk. Now, one of the things I've noticed about buttermilk is that it tastes sour. And I looked up online and apparently it's supposed to taste that way. 
but I also looked at the nutrition information and it's super good for you. Um, so even as we think about the wrath of God and, and certain difficult seasons we may be going through, um, ultimately it may taste sour, just like um, Eli's favorite beverage. Um, but it does, it does us a good that uh, comfort could never do us. Um, and in the end, we're always in God's hands. Um, so thank you, Jesus, um, that we're in your hands, that um, you know us inside and out. Lord, even as um, you suffered, you promised that we would not always have um, sunny days, um, but that we would have trouble. But Lord, you said to take heart, for you have overcome this world that we will have trouble in. Lord, maybe we're having trouble right now. Um, we just cry out to you and depend on you. Um, that uh, you'll bring us through um, and that we will know that our Redeemer lives, that we will see you um, standing. Thank you, Jesus. Um, be with us this week. Uh, amen.